Well, good morning, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those words. You're going to hear them again later in the service. Um, But blessings on you as you gather in this place. We are the people of God called in unity to sing praise to our Lord's name, to witness to our faith both together here and in the world beyond us, to know Christ and to make Christ known wherever we are. And I'm glad to be a part of that with you here this day. We are the body of Christ unified to to proclaim God's goodness and to minister to one another, to help exhort each other to go further in faith. I'm Pastor John Mark McLean, together with Pastor Keith Copenhoffer this morning. And it's our joy to lead you in worship this morning and to minister alongside you and to receive communion with you as well. We are the body of faith together. I know we have us newcomers in our midst here as well as on the internet. I pray God's blessings upon you. We pray this is a meaningful time of worship for you, that you feel blessed in your time here, surrounded by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the love of the people of God, and you can go forth refreshed and renewed in your call, both to follow and to serve in the name of Christ. A little later in the service, we will come to a time of Holy Communion, uh, where we gather at the Lord's table, and it is the Lord's table. It is not Hope's table, it's not a Lutheran table, it's the Lord's table of grace. If you're baptized into faith, you are not just welcome to come, but encouraged to come, participate in Holy Communion. It's a family table, and there's always more room for family. We're glad you're here. If there's some way we can minister to you in your life or walk with you in a need, or you know someone else we can be helpful to, please let us know. That is our desire to make Christ's grace known everywhere we can, and we would love to do that with or alongside of you. There's just a handful of announcements this morning. The first is about the flowers that are so beautiful here today. They're given um, by Dave and Ann Aho in honor of their 57th wedding anniversary. So celebrate them and give thanks and praise to God for that blessing. Um, also, and then this is a little further down the road, but I want you to have it on your calendar in your mind. On Sunday, July 25th, weeks, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., that is not a change to a new worship time. It's not a four-hour worship time. You're okay. From 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., we are partnering with our neighbors next door at Fairway Christian for the big red bus. That's the blood drive. So the bus is going to be parking between our congregations so both of us can participate equally um, to help give life and hope to those who are most in need. Now, my father has, I can't remember what kind it is, it's the very rare blood type um, where uh, it's for babies and things like that, and they would call him every month to ask how recently he had been tapped because they wanted to tap him again. They used to call it that. 
And my dad was always very happy to do that because it guaranteed him a rare steak dinner after church to fortify his blood. So if that's what it takes to get you out there, we hope you'll do that. Go get your steak dinner, whatever it takes, um, to give a blessing in that way. We're glad to partner with our brothers and sisters next door in this. Lastly, I need to share um, news with you about uh, a passing in our congregation. On Friday, July 9th, uh, Sonia Frano um, passed away um, after having a, a massive stroke a couple days before and spending just a day and a half or so at Cornerstone Hospice. She can struggle with some other health things for a short period of time, um, but this was unexpected. And yet, and I want you to hear this from her because it speaks directly to the sermon later. The day before uh, she passed, she said to the kids, um, today is the day I get to see Jesus. And they said, we don't think it'll be today, Mom. And it wasn't. It was the next day. But that assurance and that peace she had that she wasn't worried, remember that as a testimony when we come to the sermon today because that's what the text is about. Um, it's about who we are in Christ and what that means for us. So I hope you remember her testimony. Um, we do not have a day or a time for a service as of yet. As soon as we have that, we'll be letting the congregation know. I'm sure it'll be pretty shortly in the future. But we'll let you know as soon as we have more details. With that, I ask if you'd stand where you are, prepare hearts and minds as we go to the Lord to worship his name. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who brings us safely through the sea, who gives us water from the rock, and who leads us into the land of milk and honey. Amen. Let us come home to God, confessing our sin. Merciful Father, we have sinned against heaven and before you. We do not fully live as your sons and daughters. We use your gifts to our own ends. Forgive us and restore us that we may resist all that draws us away from you and be at peace with one another. Amen. We are reconciled to God through Christ. For his sake, God does not count our trespasses against us. Once dead in sin, we now are alive to God. Once lost, we now are found. God clothes you in the finest robes of all, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, forgiving you all of your sins, and making of you a new creation. Amen. From our God who loves us with an everlasting love, who brings forth a new creation in Christ, who leads us by the Spirit in the wilderness, grace and abundant mercy be with you all.
Let us pray together. O God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The lesson for the day from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his, of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestows on us, in the beloved. In him we have, re we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him, things in heaven and things on this earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and his will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live in the praise of his glory. To him you also, when you had heard the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, and were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, this is the pledge of our inheritance toward the redemption of God's own people to the praise of God's glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and let us pray. Now speak, Lord, in this moment, while we wait on thee, and hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Amen. This week, we make a transition from the Psalms that we've been in for several weeks to a several week study on the book of Ephesians. Uh, and this letter is an important letter. It's not the longest of Paul's, but it's one of the most full of Paul's. There's a lot of richness to this. You've already heard language this morning that should be familiar to you. Um, the greeting itself is very familiar. I use it at the beginning of almost every service. Other pastors do it just before they preach. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a place where it comes from. Now, he does this in Colossians and some other places, but it, it's a fairly common Pauline entry into a letter and a greeting. It, it states also who he is as an apostle of God by the grace of Jesus Christ, and he also goes into who it's for. And we begin this letter today um, with an overview of the whole letter quickly before getting into the first chapter, the meat of it, uh, which is our real focus for today. Now, let me say at the outset, um, this first chapter is interesting. It's really a list of things. It's a litany of statements he's making. Um, verses 3 through 14 are, as some pe people say, just a run-on sentence. He just gets carried away with himself, and he's just kind of spewing forth praise to God. It's very much like the Psalms we read of late. He just can't hold in it anymore. It's just bursting at the seams. And he just goes on and on and on, talking about all the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. But who is he saying it to? We know it's from Paul. He's very clear on that. We say Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, but the reality is our earliest manuscripts, and the vast majority of them, do not have anything about Ephesus in them. It says to the saints, those who are being faithful. The Ephesians part came in later in some later documents, and we've kind of kept it because we don't like to say it's a, a letter to just people. It's nice to have it be a location like other people, but it's not as directed. It's not a letter that even speaks to a specific situation and a specific time of a group like Corinthians does about the issues of their local church. It's much more broad than that. It's been stated that it is the least personal or the most impersonal of the letters that Paul wrote. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but it's not always personal greetings to individuals in a location. It's much broader than that. It's really a circular letter. That is, it's a letter that would be written uh, about a topic and about an idea, about a, a theology that was shared with a, a group of people and was meant to be shared with multiple groups because it's about a, an understanding of the truth of God less than an understanding of the situation they find themselves in. And the beauty of that, it not being just to the church in Ephesus, that could be applied to anyone, is that it's written in a way that it should be applied to everyone in the church. That means we read the letter of Ephesus, and we read this book of the Bible, it's not just to the people there, it's to you and me. It's written specifically in a, for a purpose of being shared among the saints of the church. So hear these words as the words of Paul, really the words of God through Paul, to you today. I'm going to start out by saying there's a lot of familiar language in this, especially as Lutherans. There's a lot you're going to hear and say, we use that language all the time, what's the big deal? That's one of Paul's concerns. One of Paul's concerns is that we become so familiar with things, we forget to let them have the impact they should. So we're going to try to get back on track with some of those today. Even the basic greeting at the beginning, it's a Roman format. This is who I am, this is who it's to, and a blessing bestowed is one we should look at. Grace and peace be unto you. Those are words we use a lot. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's the, the love and the mercy and the grace of God given to us not because we deserve it, in fact, when we least deserve it, 
simply because God desires to give it to us. It's a blessed gift of grace. It's what we stand in as the people of God. We should celebrate that, Paul would say. And not only do we already have it, but he desires for us to have more of it. And there's that second word, peace. So how many of you, and for those that are newcomers here, I make you do calisthenics, you have to raise your hand in church. Not both, we're not Pentecostal, just one. You just pick one or the other. So I'm gonna ask you a question. How many of you, how many of you like more peace in your life? Or in the world? We all use more of that, right? But what kind of peace? If you ask us in our house on any given moment, any given day, we'd say we'd like some peace and quiet. Because we have two kids and we could use amen, we could use some of that. Uh, peace and quiet. And, and those really go together often, people. Peace for most of us and the world, the way the world looks at peace is the absence of strife. It's the absence of turmoil. It's the absence of anxiety. Peace is the absence of negativity. We want a negativity removal in our life. Just get rid of the bad stuff. A normal everyday day would be fine. Just get rid of the negative things in life. That's the way the world defines peace. That's not the way the scripture defines peace. It's not the kind of peace that Jesus talked about in the Gospel of John or that Paul is praying over us today. It's a different kind of peace. The best analogy I've heard of that is that there was a, a, a wonderful um, art exhibit that was being done. It was a competition where people from all over the nation that were all painters were asked to paint uh, a picture that really summed up one word as well as they could. And that word was peace. And many people gave their entries and they finally got down to the final two entries. Uh, one of these was going to win the whole thing. The first one was unveiled and it was this beautiful gorgeous, serene, um, kind of pastoral scene set in the mountains. And here's a meadow in the midst of the mountains, and in the middle of the meadow is a beautiful lake. And it is beautiful and serene and calm. There's not a ripple in it. It looks exactly like a mirror. And this beautiful setting, as wonderful and as realistic as it looked, was so well done that the reflection of the mountains and the, and the skies and the birds and the trees behind the lake were so perfectly done that if you were to turn it upside down, it looked like a, a slightly dimmer version, stroke for stroke, of the rest of the painting. It was absolutely pristine. And everyone thought, that's what peace looks like. That's what we want in our lives. We want a peace where everything's just calm. Then this competition was unveiled. And what was there shocked people. It was a cacophonous waterfall. You could hear it just looking at the picture with the froth and the foam and the water spattering everywhere. And you could almost hear it and feel the rushing water. You thought if you got close enough to it, you'd get wet. It was just an energy-laden painting. Well, that doesn't sound like peace at all. Why in the world would you enter that into a competition about peaceful artwork? But then if you look closer, there was a rock that was jutting out from the midst of that waterfall. And hanging off the end of that rock was a gnarled, twisted bush. And at the end of the branch of that bush was a bird's nest. And in that bird's nest was a mother bird with her wings over her sleeping chicks, with her head back singing a song. That's a different kind of peace. Not a peace that's only peaceful in the absence of things that are tumultuous in life, but that is peaceful and joyous in the midst of strife, that can sleep through the loudness of the waterfall, and that can sing a song of praise despite what's going on around you. That's the kind of peace Christ offers that's different than the world, and it's exactly what Paul's talking about. And it's based on the grace that's already been mentioned. God grants us grace, and in the midst of that grace, that reception we have of un God's unmerited favor, and, and the assurance of God's love for us, and the assurance that that love is never ending and will be with us forever, we can find peace and hope and joy. Paul says all that in just a few words. How different would the world be today if you and I and Christians around the world truly lived as people of grace and peace. If we didn't just use it as a, a greeting or as a blessing or as a prayer, but if we really lived that out, if that was at the core of who we were, and when people met us, they experienced God's grace and peace in knowing us, do you think the world would be a better place? 
Do you think as many people would have to ask for more peace in the world or would it just happen if we were really those people? And he moves on. And he begins, my least favorite thing to preach on, he begins a list. Because lists are like a checkoff list. You just go down and say, section one is this and two is this. And you explain and we're kind of doing that today. But Paul has a reason for this. And he starts off with a big thing. God has richly blessed us with every blessing of the heavenly places. There is nothing God holds back from us. Every blessing of joy and richness and peace and grace and mercy, all these things are ours in abundance. Nothing is held back. Well, that sounds like the end of a sermon to me, right? Don't get your hopes up. I mean, that's everything. He's just given us everything. What more is there to say? I'm glad you asked, Paul would say. Because it's good for us to know that nothing's held back, but he wants us to know the specifics of what God has done. The first thing he says is, God has chosen you. He's chosen you. That's a very important statement. It doesn't sound like much. Many of us, at least I learned, the importance of being chosen in PE class early in elementary school. You know where I'm going with this? The teacher would choose two captains to have teams, and then they would what? Choose their teams. And when did you want to get picked? First, or at least early, right? At first is great, but at least early. You want to be your best friend that was the captain, or you want to be known as the best kicker, the best runner, or the best thrower, or the best something. You want to get picked early. You didn't want to get picked last. Being chosen is important. Belonging is important. Alfred Adler and other psychologists have stressed that for years, the importance of belonging to something. Do we belong? God says, I've chosen you. You belong to me. You're important to me. I have called you by name. And then Paul takes it a little further. It's not just about being called. It's not just about being chosen. It's the way in which we're chosen. Because we're chosen to something. We're chosen to be both holy and blameless. Holy is a word we use a lot in the church. It has two very distinct meanings all wrapped in one word. On the one hand, to be holy in our minds is to be without sin and to be pure and to be cleaned and sanctified. And God does that for us through the merits of Christ. So we are made that way. But it's also a state of being. It's a state of being special and set apart to something intentionally and purposeful in life. In this case, to serve God. Now, I know something about what it is to have something that's holy and set apart um, because my mom had dishes like that when I was a kid. Maybe your parents had those. We had the family dishes we used all the time. Then we had the guest dishes. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the nice china and the crystal and the silverware that only came out a few times a year. And it was my job to polish all the silver or to wipe all the plates, make sure they're just right. And you couldn't throw those in the dishwasher. Oh, no, no, no. They had to be hand cleaned, Right? which is why they were my least favorite dishes in the house, because it was a lot more work to take care of. But my mom wanted to put out the very finest and best for those moments. They were holy. They had a special purpose. We have a special purpose unto God, to serve God. With our praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, we, pray, we, we serve God. It is really through our love of God that we're serving God, and that we are also are called to love our neighbors and to love one another and to serve those around us all of these are things we are called to and set apart for. We can only do them by the gift of grace. But by the grace we're given, we are called and created to do just these things. It's not enough to just be called. Being called to set aside something special and cleansed for that purpose is nice, but there's more blessing and it's a much deeper statement than that. He says that we have been adopted. That's an important term. How many of you are pretty sure of who you are today? Do you know your name? Right. Do you know where you're from? Do you know, these are the questions you usually ask somebody, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? You know what the old words used to be asked, that you would ask people, and in some places still is? Whose are you? Who are your kin? Who do you belong to? Who are your people? Paul thinks it's a much more important statement to ask. Ian Lewis thought so as well. He's from Lancaster, England. 
At the age of 13, he decided he was going to study his family tree. He wanted to know his roots, where he was from, everything he could find out about his background. And he spent 30 years tracking this down. He tracked himself from this century all the way back to the early 17th century. And in doing this research, he uncovered all sorts of people. He interviewed over 2,000 of his relatives throughout Great Britain. He researched not only the depth of the family tree, but the breadth of it as well to make sure there were no leaves unturned, so to speak. And he decided he was finally going to write a book about it when he found interesting things. He felt that he had a great-grandfather who had moved to Russia during the time of the Tsars to seek their fortune, and that his grandfather after that had been thrown out during the time of the Revolution. But then everything changed for him. One discovery changed everything he'd done for 30 years when he found out that he was adopted. His name had not been Lewis at all. His born name was David Thornton. And he started to question who he really was. And he started the work all over again. Adoption's a powerful metaphor. It's something we need to treat very gently and very reverently in the world today. We often make little quips about adoption. You know, you'll see a, a child who looks slightly different in a family. Um, maybe they have a different color hair. And so they say, oh, are they adopted? You know, ask questions like that. We don't realize how hurtful that can sometimes be. But it can also be a great blessing in those moments. One uh, family was being talked about, a picture of a family in a book in a classroom of elementary school kids, and somebody asked the question, and is that child adopted? It was the only kid who looked very different, and, and the rest of the class was wondering what that meant, and another child said, well, what's adoption? And the little girl said, well, I can tell you about adoption because I'm adopted. And they said, what does adoption mean? He said, being adopted means you grew in your mommy's heart instead of her belly. I love that. We are adopted as the daughters and sons of God. We grew in the heart of God and have been there all along. How different would your life be today if I told you everything you thought you knew about yourself was wrong? You're not who you thought you were. You're not from where you thought you were from. None of the things in your past matter anymore. If that was all wiped out, would that change your life a little bit? How many of you would be happy with that? How many of you would find that very troubling? Right? I guess it depends where you're from. If you're in a life of comfort and of peace and of tranquility and you have what you need and all those things, then you wouldn't want your life shaken up. But what if your life was an utter mess? What if your life was nothing but chaos? I think I have to remember something that Michael Green states about this text. He says, we need to remember that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. We are dead in sin and brokenness. It is our history, it is our background, it's part and parcel to being the human race. Paul's aware of all that, and adoption, this term he's using, is a Roman concept. He's speaking to Greeks and Romans, by the way, not to Jews in the language he uses. And it's a Roman concept where somebody who was going to be adopted from one family into another, especially if their current father was still alive, because you belong to your father in a sense, um, the, the person who was going to adopt them would go to their birth father and would say, I want to adopt your child. And they would exact a price. It's going to cost you this much. And they would pay a fee in front of a, a tribunal, in front of a, a group of leaders of uh, the state. They would pay the fee, and they would receive the fee, and then they give it back again. And then they would pay him a second time, and they would receive the fee, and they give it back again. And then a third time, they would pay the fee and wouldn't get it back. And in that moment, everything of your past life, your name, your relationships, everything ended. Even if your former family had debts and liens against them, if there was something wrong with them, not just financially, but, but legally, anything that was, that was part and parcel to your old family no longer applied to you. Everything about your being was defined by your new family. You were adopted into that family and you were defined by that family. You were an heir to that parent and your name and your identity changed. If you were 30 years old, it was like you were born that day. The old self was gone. 
Much like being buried in Christ in baptism and rising to new life, that's what the image of adoption meant in the Roman world. So guess what? In case you didn't know it, all those things you thought about yourself, about who you were maybe, they were all wrong. Next time somebody asks you who you are, you need to say, I'm a daughter or son of the king because that's who you are. When you define yourself that way, Paul would say it changes everything. He begins to list all the blessings that flow from that. Again, it's a very poetic, liturgical way of sharing, but it's lengthy. And he goes into all these ways that God's blessed us. We're chosen, we're adopted, we're redeemed and forgiven. Didn't we already cover that with the other two? Well, yes, but Paul would say, I don't want you to, to take it too lightly. You are redeemed and forgiven through Christ's blood, a reminder of the great price paid for us. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great author, would say, and the great pastor, he would say it's the cost of discipleship. There was a price that was deep that was paid for us. Don't take it lightly. I mentioned the uh, plates and things that were special to my mom on those days, but there's other things that are of sacred value in households. And as a pastor, I've often gone to visit homes where perhaps there is a, an item of a beloved former family member. It could be something of very great value financially or just emotionally has great value. And a person in the family want to share that with me and they'll come over and they'll place it in my hands. And I am terrified in that moment. And I hold it ever so gently lest I even get a fingerprint on it because I don't want to damage it. At the same time, I'm trying to hold it firmly at the same moment as I'm trying to hold it gently because I don't want to drop it and have it be broken. And I find myself in this tension of trying to take it so seriously and to honor it so greatly that I don't let anything bad happen to it that I recognize the value it has. That's how we're to treat the grace of God in our life. We're to hold on to it so that we won't ever let it go, but we're also to treat it with reverence. So Paul calls us to do. And all this he says, he goes on through some more lists, but all of this he says is a gift that's given to us in the here and now. This isn't just a promise for someday. We get it today. And the Holy Spirit that wells up within us and surrounds us and binds us together as a community is the sign and seal of this gift of God. That all these blessings and these graces that, that Paul is just dancing around the room and crowing about, and you can hear him singing praise to God. And as uh, Keith was saying earlier, his poor scribe is trying to keep up with him and write it all down. He's just so effusive in praise and so exuberant about this. He says, we know it's all true because the Holy Spirit seals it. And the seal, the actual seal he's talking about was a wax seal that was placed on a parcel that would proclaim who it belonged to. That no one else was to have that except for the person it was sealed to. That you are sealed unto God as God's people. And only God owns you. But the Holy Spirit's also the guarantor or the guarantee of this. The gift of the Spirit in our life is also a deposit in that same language, a deposit that was made when a contract was entered into, and it was a, a decent piece of the payment that you'd pay up front to guarantee that the full payment was to come. The joy and the peace and the hope you have today is but a foretaste of what is to come, but it is also a promise that God will make perfect every work that he's begun in your life. Why is Paul so excited about this? These languages and these topics we already think we know about? Because they're foundational to who we are. They are our identity in Christ. And if we can't get our heads and our hearts around this and own these things, then we're going to have difficulty in the chapters that are to come when Paul starts fleshing out what God wants us to do with these blessings and who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live in the midst of of being God's people. For now, it should be enough to ground us and make us more than content in the here and now, but just as it is a foretaste and blessing of what God's going to give us in the future, so Ephesians 1 is just a foretaste of the brilliant life God calls us to that we'll hear about in the weeks ahead. So, Almighty God, we give ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. We glorify your name for the work you have done in and through us, through the person of Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, may we ever walk 
in your grace and your peace and proclaim the same everywhere we go, reveling in the joyful fact that we are your people and your children and letting others know that your love is there to welcome them to the family as well. And may we be the first faces they see that do just that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please stand as you're able. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Loving God, you welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church. Lavish your wisdom upon us and redeem us from our faults that by our witness all might praise your glory, Lord, in your mercy. Awesome creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth, nourish the growth of fruit, of grain, and other crops, and bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are survivors of violence. Guard the refugees and the immigrants and protect all those who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, we pray for this holy house and for all those who worship here. We pray especially for those whose efforts behind the scenes go often unnoticed, for the custodians and the maintenance workers, for our church staff, and for all of our volunteers. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, God, for the saints, martyrs, and prophets who have died in the faith, we remember those in this community who have recently died. Unite, united with them as God's children, assure us that we are yours forever. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image, and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love 
remain steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. And you spoke to us through your prophets who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending, ending, unending hymn. mighty and merciful God. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and on the cross he opened his arms to us all. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to his father, and then he gave it for all to drink and said, this cup is a new covenant. It's a new promise sealed by my blood to shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us join our hearts and voices together now as we pray the prayer which our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Broken and divided, in him we are united. Let all who thirst, all who hunger, come and be filled with the goodness of God. Amen. Please be seated.
Gracious Lord, your body and blood is shed, given and shed for those who are gathered together as your community, both those here present in body and those present in spirit who will receive this sacrament, Lord, at the hands of your servants who delivered it to them. We pray you would bless this food, this drink, to their nourishment in your grace, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as you're able. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Speak to God.